Welcome back to the course in nuclear medicine physics. Today we're looking at PET imaging. Now, PET stands for positron emission tomography, and maybe that sounds confusing, but it's actually a very simple concept. A positron is the antimatter component of the electron, and when a positron meets an electron, they annihilate, they vanish, and two photons appear and they get emitted back to back in the rest frame of the electron positron. Now, if we have a ring of detectors and the photons are emitted back to back, we can detect each of them and we know the line where they came from. So if a type of radiation emits a positron inside your body, the positron is gonna travel a little bit, meet an electron, which are abundant in our bodies, annihilate, and two photons are gonna come out of the body back to back. This is different than SPECT imaging, where only a single photon comes out of your body. In this lecture, we'll also look at various types of radioisotopes that emit positrons so that you can use them for PET imaging. So we're going to give a number of talks here in multiple parts going through the uh, wonderful technology and practice and art of PET imaging. Um, so we're gonna begin with an introduction here. So what is PET? Standing for positron emission tomography, it's a functional and molecular imaging technique where radiopharmaceuticals with positron emitting radionuclides are visualized in the subject that is being scanned. And PET imaging can be used um, not just to visualize, but also to measure and quantify. Uh, processes, uh, biochemical and physiological processes in vivo. Um, so PET has originally, PET was envisioned as a research tool, particularly for the brain. That's where fluorodeoxyglucose FTG PET was used. And we're gonna talk about that, but it's really found important routine clinical applications beyond research, it continues to be used extensively for both clinical imaging and uh, clinical um, tasks and also research oriented studies. And an area of significant clinical use has been in oncology, it continues to be in oncology, though PET is also used in other clinical uh, uh, frontiers such as cardiovascular and brain imaging, uh, especially with the emergence of amyloid imaging, for example, looking at Alzheimer's disease. Um, the most widely used radio tracer or radio pharmaceutical has been uh, the so-called fluorodeoxyglucose, radio labeled with fluorine 18. It follows a similar metabolic pathway as glucose in vivo, except that it is not metabolized um, you know, all the way and gets trapped within tissue. And we will see this uh, shortly. And that's an advantage because it, it would accumulate. Uh, for example, in the tumors. And this makes it really well suited to use as a glucose uptake uh, radio tracer. And this is especially of interest in oncology, for example, where, uh, you know, cancer cells that are proliferating, they're going to be depicting um, increased rates of glucose metabolism, as you sort of might be seeing in this image. So you can sort of think of it as, it, it's a glucose, glucose analog, sometimes sort of to, to use uh, just a, uh, a simplified language, we call it radio labeled sugar. Uh, it is a glucose analog, it behaves like glucose and it, it basically uh, allows you to visualize and quantify metabolism as such. So here's an example of, for example, how the standard uptake value uh, in the image, uh, which is essentially the, you know, the, the numbers that you get in the image, um, as a function of time, how they grow. This is a metric that we will visit in the future. It's, it's a normalized metric. A value of one represents sort of background images and values more than one depict higher metabolism. So you sort of see that uh, as you inject it, uh, fluorodeoxyglucose is first in the plasma in the blood, then it enters tissue and into the cells. And after that, it, um, there is this process of phosphorylation where you have fluorodeoxyglucose 6-phosphate. But the point is, and this is the accumulation, if you have increased metabolism, such as in tumors, you have increased accumulation, 
And the K4 here is assumed to be and measured to be very small. Sometimes it's just totally ignored, but the point is it's very small. So you have an accumulation uh, of fluorodeoxyglucose. glucose. That's what, what, why you have in a tumor, it keeps accumulating, keeps accumulating, accumulating because you have high rates of metabolism. Whereas in other organs, uh, in a good number of other organs, it, it, it has an initial uptake because you know, it is entering the, the cells, but then it, it, uh, you know, it is entering the cells through this mechanism but uh, it is then leaving um, as the blood is uh, cleared from fluorodeoxyglucose. Um, and so this is just a chemical, you know, detailed description of what I just told you there. But again, essentially you have, you have FDG in plasma, this exact same uh, radio pharmaceutical here, but then the, here it's phosphorylated and this is where it's trapped. And when it gets trapped, it is trapped within the cells and it is accumulating when you have higher rates of metabolism. Now, there are many applications for PET, um, as we've alluded to. So it's not just for oncologic imaging of cancer, but it's also in looking at neurochemical processes in the brain. For example, you've got cardiovascular imaging you could be imaging inflammation with it, infection with it, many, many, many different things. So I kind of like this uh, statement here that kind of allows you to capture uh, what's going on. At, apart from its heavy use in clinical oncology, fluorodactyl glucose PET CT, let alone PET in general, right? This is just for FTG, but even PET in general is, has even wider applications. But even FTG PET is widely used in a variety of non-oncology conditions interconnecting to such disciplines as general internal medicine, infectious diseases, cardiology, neurology, surgery, traumatology, orthopedics, pediatrics, endocrinology, rheumatology, psychiatry, neuropsychology, and cognitive neuroscience. So it's just an amazing range of applications that PET, and specifically FDG PET have seen. But again, PET imaging has, has, has a wide range of uh, clinical and research activities that it has witnessed. Um, and the other thing is quantitative imaging, which in a future lectures we will talk about, but PET imaging allows you to do quantitative measurements of biochemical and physiological processes in vivo. And this is very important in both research and also in clinical applications, finding more and more applications. For example, it has been shown that quantitative measurements of FTG uptake in tumors can be useful in the assessment of response to therapy. So traditionally, you might have heard of this thing, CT-based response evaluation criteria in solid tumors, widely used. You know, there's been a lot of interest um, in the past years on this thing, for example. This is just one example, but using PET essentially to assess response to therapy. Let's say if a patient is undergoing chemotherapy, if you do PET imaging before, and after therapy and looking at the numbers, does that allow you to better assess, um, better assess whether the, the treatment is working or not? And that would that allow you to better modify and plan for, for future therapies? Um, so let's talk about some of the fundamentals and the physics of positron emission, because at the end of the day, that's what it stands for, positron emission tomography. So let's see what positron emission is about. And again, in some of the uh, earlier lectures, Carlos has talked about uh, some nuclear reactions, et cetera, but this one is the one that we're gonna focus on today, where you have a parent um, uh, radionuclide that emits to um, a daughter radionuclide. And in this process, a positron is emitted and essentially you have a proton that has been changed to a neutron. That's what happens. So that's why the total atomic number, um, the to sorry, the total atomic mass remains the same, but the atomic number you sort of see goes down, right? Because you've lost the proton, but you gained the neutron, so the atomic mass remains the same. Um, and so you you emit a, po a positron and a neutrino. We don't image the neutrino. It's very, very hard to, to, to measure neutrinos. There's, that's a whole frontier on its own. But the only real practical implication of the fact that neutrinos are emitted is that the final kinetic energy of the positron and the neutrino is shared between the two of them. 
So the positron could be emitted with a range of energies, with a range of kinetic energies. So it's not possible to predict, you know, which one are we gonna get here, but you can get a range of positron emission energies. And then what happens after that? Well, so after that, um, the positron travels a little bit within tissue and it is slowed down, okay? So it's kinetic energies, it could be high, it is slowed down. And finally, um, it annihilates in combination with electrons, okay? So it is slowed down, this is called a positron range. Okay, so this, this could be, for example, let's say half a millimeter, okay? And then finally you have the positron and an electron, the two of them annihilate, the classic equals mc squared, the entire rest mass is lost to two gamma rays in opposite directions, anti-parallel, and the rest mass of, of an electron and a positron each is 511 keV. So that's gonna be the energy that you're going to get for these two anti-parallel gamma rays, okay? Um, and so this is again, just showing the same thing where you've got the positron after a small positron range, again, sub-millimeter typically for, for FDG, for fluorine 18, but could be more than a millimeter for other radio tracers. Um, and then after that, you've got these two anti-parallel uh, gamma rays. And um, then you get these two photons and you have detectors all around the patient, for example, that are able to say, hey, wait a minute, I got an event here, I got an event, these are arriving at almost the same time, therefore these must correspond to the same event, therefore I can draw a line of response. And so you do, you do that. Um, so we're gonna talk in more details, but again, the, in the context of let's say FDG, you might have a malignant cell that is taking up FDG more than other um, tissue in the body, it is emitting and you've got detectors around it and it is able to draw a line of response saying, I've got an event somewhere, from somewhere along this line. Now you don't know from where exactly along this line, but at least you can draw a line. And that is very good because as we've talked about before in the context of tomographic image reconstruction, if you're able to get projections of your radioactivity at different angles and you have that, those collection of angles coll collected, then you can do tomographic image reconstruction and you can actually reconstruct where this event came from. From a single line of response, you don't know where this event is along this line. But if you acquire a lot, you know, around the patient, then you can do Im image reconstruction and reconstruct the image. So let's look at um, a couple of videos here. Learn how PET imaging helps us find cancers in the body. Be it genetic or acquired, tumors are abnormal growths that begin in an area of DNA damage. Normal cells in the body divide, live, and die in a tightly regulated process that ensures our tissues and organs last throughout our lives. However, the genetically damaged cells of cancers often lose that regulatory control, dividing randomly and frequently to form a tumoral mass or lump. To support this type of unregulated growth, the tumor cell's metabolism is upregulated, requiring a significant amount of energy when compared to the normal surrounding tissues. The increased metabolic activity of a lot of cancers is a key feature of tumor cells that can help us distinguish them from the normal surrounding tissues. Using a device called a PET-CT scanner, we can actually see and document this increased metabolic activity in the tumor cells. The preferred energy source for tumors is glucose, the basic carbohydrate consisting of a hexagonal carbon-oxygen backbone with five hydroxyl side chains. If we substitute one of the hydroxyl side chains with a radioactive fluorine atom called F18, we produce fluorodeoxyglucose, also known as FDG, or more appropriately, 18-fluorine FDG. The molecule still functions like glucose in the body and is therefore known as a glucose analog. Now let's take a closer look at the fluorine 18 atom. The only stable isotope of elemental fluorine is fluorine 19 with nine protons and 10 neutrons. The isotope fluorine 18 is created in a cyclotron and still contains nine protons, but only has nine neutrons. This isotope is unstable and therefore undergoes radioactive decay. 
the radioactive fluorine atom emits a positron or a positively charged electron. The positron is antimatter and therefore quickly collides with a nearby negatively charged electron, annihilating both particles and producing two 511 kilo electron volt gamma rays, which travel away from each other at 180 degrees. The PET or positron emission tomography scanner can detect these gamma rays and determine where they came from in the body. Again, with the unregulated growth of some of these tumors, the cancer cells will pick up a disproportionate amount of the 18 FTG, allowing us to image this activity on the PET scanner. Tissues that have an increased metabolic activity and use a lot of glucose like the brain and tumor cells are going to show up bright on the PET image. So that's a quick example of how we can use the metabolic characteristics of cancer cells to find tumors in the body. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. So that was one example that I wanted to show you. And here is another one. Okay, so got the radio pharmaceutical, for example, fluor deoxyglucose injected, going through the body, taken up by the cells. But then those with higher metabolism, for example, but let's say, the brain is a place where there's a lot of metabolism going on, so you'll see it, but also in, in tumors, for example. So this would be normal uptake in the brain, but also here we have abnormal uptake. And a clinician is trained to distinguish between you know, normal uptake versus abnormal malignant uptake. Just some examples of many, many different applications. Again, these are very, for example, selective examples, right? So, so we've got four examples of four isotopes, carbon 11, nitrogen 13, oxygen 15, and fluorine 18. And, and of course, each in that lecture we gave on radio pharmaceuticals, we said that of course you could have many, many different molecules designed, tagged, with these isotopes and those molecules could be targeting different processes, different molecular uh, phenomena, and th therefore they can find applications in many different places. This is just a very, very, very small selection of examples, right? That have existed. Um, but there is even more isotopes. So we mentioned in that one, these first four, but there's also gallium 68 and rubidium 82, and there's other ones. Uh, but so you can sort of see examples of half-lives. Uh, we mentioned in an earlier lecture in radio pharmaceuticals that for routine clinical applications, you know, having half-lives that are way too short makes, makes uh, controlling the clinical environment a little bit more difficult. So that's why, you know, fluorine 18 has a good number, under two hours, gallium 68 has a good number. Um, but even rubidium, even though it has a very small half-life because you have a generator, um, uh, and that allows some added convenience uh, for many, many different sites to do uh, cardiac imaging that has definitely found applications. So again, PET isotopes can be from different sources, from cyclotrons, you know, in earlier lectures, uh, Carlos talked about cyclotrons versus generator approaches, uh, but these four would be from cyclotrons, these two from generators. You know, which one is better? There's a whole um, set of preferences and business models that are used in North America versus Europe versus Asia versus other places. Um, so it really depends. Uh, in some sense, generators have the advantage that you could have a local gener inexpensive generator in your site. Cyclotrons have the advantage that you could have a sensorial cyclotron in a city, for example, for F-18 based tracers, and it could be shipping um, radio pharmaceuticals to many different imaging centers. Um, so both have clearly found, uh, found applications. Um, yeah, so we mentioned before that um, we mentioned before that to to just in general single photon imaging. If you do not have collimators, you don't know where the source, uh, where the radiation has come from in a typical uh, gamma camera, and it 
becomes very, very difficult to visualize anything. That's why collimators were inserted. So we talked extensively about use of collimation in single photon imaging. But the beauty of PET, and this is one of the most fundamental advantages of PET, is that because you have two gamma rays, not one, so it's not single photon imaging, it's dual anti-parallel gamma photon uh, imaging, gamma imaging, is that you know if, if you've got a circuitry that tells you, well, I've got an event in one detector, I've got an event at almost the same time in another detector, you could draw a line of response between them. And you don't need a physical collimator. This is actually electronic collimation. You, you don't need to put a physical collimator here to ensure that only gamma rays from this direction enter because once you know where the other uh, you know, where pair of uh, gamma pair was detected, you can draw a line of response. So you can remove the physical collimators if we're not killing so many events and by electronic collimation, you can know. So this detector, for example, can receive events along here, 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 and they don't have to be killed. They don't have to be removed by a physical collimator. So that ends up actually significantly improving the uh, uh, sensitivity of a PET scanner. So a coincidence event is assigned to a line of response joining the two relevant detectors. And so you have positional information gained from the detector radiation without the need for a physical collimator. You know where the line of response, you know the direction, the angle of the line of response uh, without having a physical collimator. So that results in major improvements in sensitivity. Um, for example, compared to a typical, a typical parallel hole collimator, you could improve the sensitivity by, by two orders of magnitude, for example, right? Uh, two orders of magnitude is a large improvement. Of course, there's now been really novel collimator designs, pinhole collimator designs. So really uh, the uh, spect imaging world has really improved in terms of sensitivity too. Uh, and for PET, the improvement has happened by this electronic collimation. Also, it turns out you get in, improved uniformity of the point spread function. Why? Because in single photon imaging, as we've discussed a couple of times before, as you get away from the face uh, of the collimator, um, your, your point spread function and your resolution degrades, becomes worse. Um, but it turns out when you have two coincidence detectors, whether you're here or here or here, sure, the profile slightly changes, um, but at the end of the day, these are pretty similar profiles. It's not like the PSF is significantly widening the, because at the end of the day, you're constrained to be within this kind of, you know, strip connection between these two coincidence detectors. So, so there's really significant uniformity of the resolution, regardless of where you are on that line of response, unlike in single photon image. So uh, not having a collimator, a physical collimator in PET versus single photon uh, imaging uh, has an increased, uh, it results in increased sensitivity. Um, of course, a collimator in single photon imaging can be adjusted to, for example, improve sensitivity. But when you, for example, increase its sensitivity, then as we've learned before, then the resolution degrades. Or if you try to improve the special resolution, the sensitivity decreases. there's a trade-off. Uh, but here you have a very natural way to significantly increase sensitivity in PET imaging. Also reduces non-stationary or depth dependent uh, resolution, whereas in single photon imaging, the blurring gets poorer and worse as a source to collimator distance uh, increases. So um, what is the major challenge with PET? Why are we then not just doing everything with PET why are we not just switching over, you know, to put it very simply in a simple mi minded way? Well, this is so great. Why not just do it all the time? Well, uh, the major challenge or a major challenge in PET imaging is that unlike single photon imaging where the energies tend to be definitely lower, we look at typically looking at, let's say 140 kV for technetium or let's say 208 for lutetium. We're dealing with far more energetic gamma rays. So stopping these, and uh, you know, uh, coming up with appropriate you know scintillation design and all this stuff to st to 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 stop these, it could be very expensive and could be very challenging. So that it has been the challenge with PET, um, and there's been significant exciting research and, and and activity and developments in this area, and that is exactly what we will talk about next.